Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's quite a pleasure to be here to talk about my current favourite subject, which is Heathrow and how and why we should expand it. Um, as we've mentioned Fantasy Island already, let me just say that if we want to build a university and a garden city and so on, so that you need a nice big plot of land. And there is such a plot of land, it's called the Isle of Rain. Why you move an airport in order to do it, I, I just don't know. Um, the other thing is that people have asked me about Heathrow Airport and ourselves. There's a little bit of daylight between our different proposals that have been put forward, but really not huge uh, differences, and the answer really is Heathrow. So you'll not hear me criticising the Heathrow plan, and if they criticise our plan I'll kick them. Um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're really more on this together than, than, than not, because Heathrow really is the answer. So I'll run through a presentation, everything's changing rapidly, so some of it is already out of date, despite me trying to update it. Um, so if you forgive me for putting one or two corrections in, and then I'll be happy to try and answer any questions at all. Um, now I've got to work out the mechanics of this, which one's forward? That one, right. I'm not used to modern technology. So not exactly leading edge stuff in some ways. Okay, that's that's our plan. It came about for a whole variety of reasons. Um, really, just me being asked by the airport director at Beacon Hill, what did I think about Heathrow? So I gave him a plan, and his next door neighbour was a railway man who's got a plot of land up to the north. And the rest, as they say, is history. We came together, so we're a private little group. Um, we've only got a fraction of the financing of, of uh, Heathrow or of Gatwick, or indeed it would seem of uh, Fantasy Island. So we, we, we've stayed up with the big boys so far, and uh, we're pleased to be shortlisted <coughs> now into the next phase, which has involved me working nearly every day, and I thought I was retired. If I'd known this, I might have just kept quiet, but never mind. <laughs> so that's the plan. This is um, the current runway, 27 right, 27 left, Terminal 5 up there, and our plan is just to extend that northerly runway. It's already longer than we need. Extend it out through uh, to the west and make two long runways, each of 3,000 meters or so long, put 600 meters in the middle, and that 600 meters, 2,000 feet, is chosen for quite a specific reason. Um, and then you can operate them totally independently with the first bit you'd be used for landing, go to the west, the sec sorry, yes, for landing, the second bit for takeoff. Meanwhile, the southerly runway can be takeoffs and or landings. So, background. Well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't think that air travel wasn't here to stay. To stay. We're a trading nation. A trading nation needs to have contacts around the world. Uh, there's 60 million people in round numbers in the UK. There's 6 billion in round numbers out there. We need a tiny percentage of them to come, not just transit London and go on elsewhere. We need them to get off. And, and, and visit here, just as we need our own um, people to be able to go elsewhere and to go wherever business or holiday takes us. And if you think by the time this gets even nearly full, 2050, the Chinese and Indian economies and probably the economy of Indonesia will be bigger than that of America today. So air travels here, Heathrow's where the country's only big enough for one real, I call it a hub, but it's a hub for the UK. It's not a hub like Dubai is for people coming in and then going out. It's, it's a hub where people can connect to the world. Um, course transfer passengers are important, but they're only about 30% of the total. And that makes routes viable quicker. It makes them viable year round. I can speak from personal experience. How many of you have been and went travelled on Concord? Any, any? Okay, that's good. Oh, yeah. Um, 
in, in October, the businessmen in the UK and America in particular travelled. We could sell every seat at full fare, and it was, the low factors were terrific. In February, I don't know where they all went, but they certainly didn't travel on Concord. So we used to discount the fares. It used to be cheaper to travel, for instance, from Harare through London to New York on Concord than it was to fly London to New York. That was just the way it was. So transfer passengers are used to make routes viable. They're not there to make the airport more money just by having hubbing uh, in the sense that, that people think of hubs. Heathrow's full. I think there's little doubt of that. I mean, you could argue mixed mode. It means it isn't really full, but it is full to all intents and purposes. Uh, but it's a great airport. I mean, Terminal 5 meets, beats any terminal in the world. And the Queen's Terminal, that is what you're calling it, isn't it? Um, will be even better. And from a pilot's point of view, it's the safest airport. It's just, you know, you just sigh of relief when you start to talk to the London Control uh, and you come in. We think, I think, and I hope you think, Heathrow is critical for our economy both here and national. As I say, I don't think we can actually ever build up a second big airport like Heathrow. And 200 of the top 300 companies are near Heathrow within 25 miles. That's not a coincidence. That's not because somehow people like living <coughs> specifically around here. Just imagine if they had to go around the M25 to get to Gatwick. Uh, how many people have done that recently? <laughs> <laughs> so, our idea, and, and indeed he throws, is capacity where it's needed. Our plan is simple, it, it could be quick, it's cost effective. We'll make noise better. Noise when this is open and noise 20 years old will not be the noise you get from aeroplanes now. And, and our land take is, is really relatively small. So we're four separate plans, um, the north the extension of the runway, a station to the north, which will connect with the um, cross rail and the main line. Around that will be car parking, so you can take traffic off the M25 <coughs> and the M4 and the M40. And well, we're no longer going to realign the M25 because it just took out too many houses. We just have a shortish tunnel, about the same length of tunnel as into the central area now. So that's it. There's the runways. Um, to, we've shown Terminal 6 or oh, F. Forget that. That was just a bit of madness from someone. That will be a station and a car park and a link into Terminal 5 and probably the sensible area for Terminal 6 is there. Links. Improve the rail line. I'm not going to go into the detail. We've got a team working on railways and they've got spaghetti junction all over the place with railways. So there is a intention to improve links from the north to London, from the west and from the south. Which plan actually manifests itself in the end? I don't know. I can't guess. Um, but, but the road congestion, ground transport has to be dealt with. And I think both our plans actually see an increase in the number of people travelling to Heathrow by rail. Uh, and that will be essential to get rid of congestion. That's just a more detailed map with some of the roads on. So this is how it would work if this works. And it's not, there's supposed to be two aeroplanes appear here. <laughs> um, they did. They did, did they? Oh, well, they did. Yeah. You go on, they've taken that. Alright, see if it goes on the big screen. No? Right, we'll do it again. There they go, approaching and then they land and turn off and that's the go around. Before that should have been the um, landing and take off routine. Anyway, you get the idea. Yeah, as you can land and go around on those two, take off on the far one. So the benefits, simple, quick, cost effective, Private capital, I mean obviously network rail will have to do the rail work, but that will be it because they can see some money in. We don't destroy any villages, 
small number of houses, mainly because of the sorting up the the flooding and the rivers to the west of the airport, integrated with ground transport. Early morning noise I'll talk about, and we still can get respite. So we can get, if you ran this system fully, you could get nearly a million sectors. All our plans say use 700,000, so you leave 300,000 spare for respite, alternation, and so on. Let me go back to early morning noise. Uh, how big a prize would be getting rid of flights before 6 o'clock? Who would benefit from that? Who would quite like that? Normally everybody puts their hand up. <laughs> um, we think with the extra slots, I mean, one of the prime reasons that you get 16 flights from 4.30 in the morning is that um, if they don't land then, they won't land at all. There's no more slots, I think, Andrew. Is that right? I mean, that's it. So the airlines will give them up only after a huge, huge flight. There's only about two destinations where the flights need to come in uh, because they leave at midnight from Hong Kong and Singapore, I guess, in an But you could delay them a bit. You could fly slower. I mean, maybe a few have to come in from half past five to six. You know, might be the compromise. But we could certainly get rid of most of the night quota flights without any impact on the bottom line and to the airlines at all. Uh, I can talk about both carbon dioxide and oxides and nitrogen if you want to, uh, later in the question and answer. That's just a schematic of, that's where the railways were about two weeks ago. It's all changed, I can't keep up with them, so I'm wait, going to wait until they've finished their railway plans and then change that slide around. So, why hasn't Heathrow expanded already? Well, let me ask you a question. If aircraft were silent as they came in to land, do you think there'd be much of a problem about expanding Heathrow? No. Uh, but they're not silent, and they won't be for a while. But that's the arrival patterns in any one day in red, and the departure patterns in blue. Very few complaints now about departure noise. 20, 30, 40 years ago when I started flying, the emphasis was on departure noise. We measure it, we control it, we have specific noise uh, preferential routes, and the airline industry, particularly air traffic control, the airlines and the manufacturers of aeroplanes, they took their eye off this ball, which was approach noise. And it's approach noise which gives today's problem. And that red is the approach line, approach paths. But you notice how they all come together into two single red lines on the approach. Why can't there be that single red line all the way around? Why spread it out over the whole of Southeast England? Uh, there is a reason, but it's not a good one. Um, in the meantime, aircraft have been getting quieter. I've got a house at Colmbro, so when people say you don't know what it's like, I say, yeah, I do. Um, uh, aircraft are significantly quieter now than they were. And the big red things on the left, they're the noise footprint, take off and landing. And you can see right down at the bottom, 787 and the BA380. And after 2020, all new aeroplanes coming in have to be Chapter 14 aeroplane, which is the same as that or better. People ask me why I haven't put the Concorde noise profile on there, but I'd have to distort everything so much that it wouldn't quite fit. Um, things are going to get quieter. Uh, what hasn't happened is there hasn't been enough emphasis on dealing with approach noise. 